We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Steph Halpin. I'm with NYC Service, and I'm just going to quickly give you some housekeeping notes. So we'll switch over to the housekeeping notes slide. Um, just so everyone knows, this session will be recorded and we can share it afterwards. Um, if you are joining, please stay on mute if you're not speaking just to avoid any um, confusion or to uh, limit distractions. There is a Q&A feature, a question and answer feature, so please use that at any point in time to submit a question that you might have. Uh, like I mentioned a second ago, we're going to send a follow-up email that will include any info and resources that we mentioned today. And you may have noticed that when you logged into WebEx, it uh, said that the meeting would end at 4.30. That's just so we have the extra time um, and we do not get kicked off. But the session will end at 4 p.m. Uh, we'll try to make the best of your time. And with that being said, I'm going to pass it off to the city's chief service officer, Anusha Venkatraman. Thank you so much, Steph, for setting this up. And thank you to all of you who have joined this info session and this panel discussion. I am actually very excited about our discussion today. We have a fantastic mix of people who will be here in this virtual room. Um, again, my name is Anusha Venkatraman, and I have the great pleasure of serving as the city's chief service officer. I lead NYC Service, which is a division of the mayor's office that builds partnerships to deepen and expand civic engagement, particularly through volunteerism and through service. We aim to impact the city's greatest needs and make our city more equitable and inclusive in this process. Um, so just want to thank you again for joining us all today. Um, this panel uh, is, is an interesting discussion. We decided to convene it because of the important role that CBOs have to play as community-based organizations um, and other nonprofits. Um, CBOs and nonprofits have been critical throughout the COVID crisis in providing essential services and advocating for your communities um, and in sharing accurate information and educating your community members about the resources that are available to them. Um, you serve as trusted ambassadors in your communities. You are a voice that folks can rely on, and you can help provide demystifying information and address any fears or reluctance that folks have to access services. Uh, you also know your communities better than anyone, better than we do. So your input and your partnership during these challenging times is truly critical. Um, and I just want to thank you for your leadership. Um, after you hear from your panel, from the panelists here today, as Steph mentioned, you'll have a chance to ask some questions and share some of your thoughts about um, test and trace, especially how we can support you and your organizations in getting this important message out there. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce our other panelists here. Um, first, I'm going to turn to the test and trace core team and let's start with Jackie Bray. Hi, my name is Jackie Bray. I'm the uh, Deputy Executive Director of the Test and Trace Corps. So I oversee a lot of our day to day operations. And uh, we've got lots of us with you, uh, with you all today. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have a conversation about what Test and Trace is and, and how you can get involved and how much help we need from uh, trusted messengers like all of you uh, in neighborhood. So probably the team should introduce themselves because uh, they'll be better at that than I will. Annabelle, do you want to start? Sure. Thank, thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Anusha, for, for having us. Um, I'm so excited to be here with um, everyone today and to be able to share what the Test and Trace Corps um, team has been doing um, since we kicked off the program. Um, Annabelle Palma, I'm the Chief Equity um, Officer for the Test and Trace Corps, and I was truly humbled to be asked to come join the team. And my role um, in, in this position is to make sure that um, we're fighting um, the disparities caused by this pandemic, especially in the hardest hit areas of our communities. Um, I bring to this um, role my experience as a former healthcare worker, as an organizer for 1199, um, my 14 years experience as a New York City Council member, 
Um, and through that experience, I was able to build relationships um, and deep um, community bondages um, throughout the Bronx and New York City. And so I um, hope that we can um, bring you know, everyone together, especially those partners in our community-based organizations to help us do the work that we need to do to get New Yorkers safe and healthy and reopen New York in the safest possible way. Thank you all. Great, thank you, Annabelle. Um, Dr. Torian Easterling is with us today from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Torian. Awesome. It's so good to see your faces. I've been working with you so, so long. It's so good to see your faces. Um, good afternoon. My name is Tori Anitoli. As we mentioned, uh, I serve as a deputy commissioner at the New York City Department of Health and uh, Mental Hygiene. Uh, my division I lead uh, is the Center for Health and Community Wellness, uh, and specifically uh, in New York City contact tracing efforts. I've been supporting our test and trace community advisory board. Uh, and making sure that we're integrating uh, uh, community uh, board members' participation uh, in the contact tracing efforts. Uh, as we're talking about the roles in which community partners can play, certainly sharing data and thinking about how we can make decisions around this operation is, is part about how we can share responsibility. So you certainly see this as a collective effort. So happy to be here with you all. Thank you, Torian. And um, last but certainly not least, we have Rebecca Balin with us today. Uh, Rebecca serves as our outreach leader for the Test and Trace Corps, and she really coordinates uh, internally uh, how city outreach staff across all of our agencies are engaging in this effort around Test and Trace, and then is really the tip of the spear when it comes to engaging community-based organizations um, she organized our date of action last week, which was a big success. It was the single largest testing day for the uh, health and hospitals. Um, and so, Rebecca, you're with us today, too. Yes, thank you, Jackie. Um, and really happy to be here today, especially um, I've known Anusha for quite some time um, and love working with this incredible test and trace team. So, um, you know, just Quickly, we all know I, I, we all know why test and trace is so important. We know that short of a vaccine, there's very little that we can do to stop the spread, except socially distance, uh, wear our face covering, stay home if we're sick, and then get tested and safely separate if we test positive. So, um, you know, I know that Anusha has some questions, and Stephanie has some questions um, for us. So, I'll I'll kick it to you. Um, and if it's helpful, we have a PowerPoint, so just let me know if, if that's helpful. Oh, wonderful. Um, so the PowerPoint might actually be useful in my first question, and I think, Rebecca, you started to touch on this, test and trace. It sounds simple, but we just want to make sure everyone is on the same page. What is it, and what are the key points that community members need to know? I'm going to try to share my screen, which I'm not totally able to do it seems um so i don't know if somebody i don't know jackie if you're better able to do it it's not working. i i it does it doesn't look like i'm able to do it either but why don't we start talking it through and steph if there's a way on the webex that you can let me share content that would be awesome um i'm not sure as a panelist if i can or if i have to be the host but ah there we go yep hold on it worked um <laughs> is it so i mean i could just start rambling and we're then working. We're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're almost there <laughs> just takes a minute so the test and trace core is the city's effort to test as many new yorkers as we can to talk to every new yorker who tests positive for covid19 to help them keep themselves safe help them keep their family safe, but also to elicit from them any people that they've come into close contact with since they could have been infectious with COVID-19, to reach out to all of those people, we call those people close contacts, and to talk to the, that group of people about how to quarantine themselves or about how to safely separate themselves. And, and by doing this, by testing as many New Yorkers as we can, 
by helping people se safely separate if they test positive, so isolate themselves if they test positive, by eliciting a list of people that they've come into close contact with, and then helping that group of people also safely separate, also quarantine themselves. By doing all of that, we stop chains of transmission. And so we can really box in the virus. One way that I think about it often is that, you know, in, in March and April and May and most of June, we were all quarantining. We were all self-quarantining. I mean, we called it stay at home, but really what we were doing is we were all staying safely away from everyone in order to make sure that we didn't get the virus and that we stopped the transmission of the virus across the city. And what testing and tracing is all about is what is really like, it is um, targeted stay at home, right? It's targeted quarantine, targeted isolation. So instead of saying to all New Yorkers, everyone stay home, we can say we're finding the New Yorkers that must stay home. We're keeping them safely at home or safely in a hotel. We'll talk about that too. Um, and, and, and for 14 days, for 10 or 14 days, and that way, not everyone has to stay home. And so that way we can start to reopen the city safely. Um, so I'm gonna step through with Rebecca this PowerPoint. And then I think Torian and Annabelle have um, other pieces of this. Is that right, Anusha? That sounds great. And I can awesome. chime in with some questions to make sure we're, we're not missing anything. Great. All right, so we are right here in this declining transmission. We're really in the suppression stage of, of this epidemic, of this pandemic here in New York City. Doesn't mean that we won't see in any increase in cases. We could, obviously, we're seeing across the country increases in cases, but we're really in a suppression stage. We have very little um, virus transmission happening in the city right now. Only about 2% of people getting tested are testing positive. And we're testing about 30,000 New Yorkers a day. All right. See, now it won't let me move forward. All right, hold on, guys. Oh, all right, the PowerPoint might be a fail. Um, but we really break this into three pillars or three types of work. The first pillar is our um, uh, testing pillar. And our goal is to test as many New Yorkers as we can every single day. Like I said, we're testing about 30,000 New Yorkers a day. By August 1st, we want to be testing 50,000 New Yorkers a day. We're on track for that. Testing is open to everyone. If you haven't had a COVID test yet, you should go get tested. And one of the most important things for our CBO partners to do and our community partners and community leaders is to encourage their membership, to encourage the neighborhood that you work in and live in to get tested. Testing is safe. It is free. It is quick. It is in your neighborhood. Uh, there's over 200 testing locations now. You can find those at uh, nyc.gov backslash COVID test. And all contact tracing, all isolation quarantine starts by getting tested. It's really important that we test all of all New Yorkers. There are also some groups of New Yorkers that need to get repeatedly tested, right? We should all get tested once, and then there are times where we should get tested again. So if you've been in a large crowd or a large gathering, uh, including any of the protests that have taken place over the last month here in New York City, you, or month, six weeks really in New York City, you need to go get tested again. So any big crowds, any big gathering, if you've been in one of them, go get tested again. If you work in a residential congregate setting, so if you have membership or community members that you work with who work in nursing homes, uh, homeless shelters, adult living facilities, um, drug rehab facilities. It's really important anywhere where it's a residential congregate setting, get repeatedly tested. If you are have been exposed to someone with COVID, so you were hanging out with a friend and you learned a couple days after you were hanging out with that friend that that friend tested positive for COVID, you've now been exposed, it's important for you to go get tested. If you broke social distancing or broke mask adherence, so. I didn't go to a big crowd, but I've been hanging out with three of my good friends and we haven't been spending six feet, you know, we're not six feet apart from each other and we're not wearing masks, go get tested again. And then finally, if you are getting ready to go see someone that's very vulnerable to COVID. So my father is 75 years old, 
he's got a heart condition. If I were going to go see my dad, I would get tested prior to seeing him. I'd wait for the results and I'd make sure to be incredibly careful between the time that I got tested and the time that I was going to see him. Those are all really important reasons to get tested a second time. So then what happens is everyone's test results statewide get sent to a system at the state. And then they get sent from the state to every locality, including New York City. And when we get them, we have a team of folks that we call contact tracers. And contact tracers call anyone who tests positive. And that's what test and trace is. This is the trace pillar of test and trace. And if, when you get a call, we really sit, talk to you about three things. The first thing we do is we ask you how you are. We wanna make sure that you are staying safe. We want to make sure that you know how to talk to a doc, you know how to contact a doctor, that you can contact a doctor. Um, we check your symptoms. We ask you questions about how to keep you safe. The second thing we do is we ask you for a list of people that you have had close contact with since you've been infectious. And for us, that means two days before you started experiencing symptoms, or if you're still asymptomatic, two days before you took your test. And we go through your phone, we go through your calendar, we ask about who lives in your household, who might um, have been providing services in your household, um, where you might have gone to work, whether or not you socialized with anyone, whether or not you went to a house of worship and, and had close contact. And we define close contact as spending 10 or more minutes with someone within six feet of them. And we take down that list of names and contact information. And then the third thing we do in that same phone call is we talk to you um, about how you keep your family safe and your loved ones safe, how you isolate, how you safely separate. For folks that have tested positive for COVID, it's important that they stay separate from anyone else for 10 days plus three days without fever or 10 days if they're never symptomatic. And so we talk to people about what do they need in order to do that. We understand that that's a real sacrifice. We understand that not everyone feels like I, they can just take 10 days and be in their home and be okay. But in order to, to stop the virus, in order to allow New Yorkers to go back to work, allow kids to go back to school, it's incredibly important that anyone that has COVID safely separate, self-isolate themselves. Uh, we give them people two options. They can come to a hotel, it's a nice hotel with free TV and free Wi-Fi and 24-7 clinical support and food and laundry. Um, or if they're choosing to stay at home, uh, that they need, to, they need to be able to safely separate themselves from their household members, from their family members or their loved ones that they're living with. And so we talk to them about that process. We talk to them about what they might need. They might need financial counseling. They might need our help signing up for paid leave through their job or the state. Uh, they might need to be connected to public benefits. They might need meals or food delivery. They might need some prescription medication delivered. They might need a bunch of different things. They might need some mental health support. Um, if they are going to a methadone clinic regularly, they, they might need their methadone delivered, right? And so we're working to make sure that someone has everything that they need in order to not leave their home for 10 to 14 days. Um, and that, that work that we call, we call that our take care pillar. So it's testing, tracing, take care. Then we take the list of contacts that that person has given us and we call all of those people. When we call all those people, we don't tell those people who gave us their information. So if I gave my sister's name to the contact tracer, the contact tracer wouldn't get my sister on the phone and say, your sister has COVID and she exposed you. That wouldn't happen. What they would say to my sister is, someone you know and that you've spent time with has tested positive for COVID-19. And now it's really important that we monitor your symptoms and that we make sure that you're able to safely separate and quarantine yourself. And for both our cases and our contacts, we then monitor everyone for 14 days. We call everyone for 14 days or for their length of their illness or their infection. Um, and we check in on them. We make sure they don't need anything else. We make sure that they are staying home and keeping everyone safe. Okay, that was a lot. Um, but that is, um, in a nutshell, what testing, tracing, and um, take care or safe separation uh, means here in New York City. 
Wonderful. That was so comprehensive and helpful, Jackie. Um, I'm wondering uh, if you could speak to privacy and any concerns um, people might have, especially around immigration status, if their family members are undocumented, or if there are any restrictions on who can access any of the, the services. Sure, of course. So um, first of all, we don't share the data or the information with anyone. Um, uh, it is only held within the test and trace core and within the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And the city health code forbids us, it's against the law for us to release that information or share that information. Um, so we, the information is both protected legally and then as a policy matter, we don't share it and we would never share it. Um, the, in terms of folks who are undocumented or folks who are in households of, of mixed documentation status, the, um, we don't ask immigration state status. We made that decision early in the process um, because it was important to us that we didn't want to disincentivize anyone's participation. We actually also don't collect social security number. So there's no like proxy that anyone could use in our data for immigration st status. Um, and we don't, we would never like participate with law enforcement or any federal authority um, with our program. Our program is really just about public health and keeping people safe. Um, all of the services that we have available to us through Take Care, um, or I should say this, any of the services that we are actively providing are, are available to anyone regardless of immigration status. So meal delivery, prescription delivery, um, we will work one-on-one -on -one with people for financial counseling or mental health support. All of that is regardless of immigration status. And we're actually getting ready to start a program to mail masks and hand sanitizer and Clorox wipes and thermometers to people. All of that will be totally blind to immigration status. Incredibly helpful, thank you. Um, I have two big picture questions and I'm gonna ask them both together and then pitch it to Dr. Easterling and to Annabelle Palma to answer. Um, the first one is, why is test and trace important for community health or for public health? And then second, what is, what role does test and trace play in creating an equitable city and ensuring that communities um, have equitable access to resources? Um, and I'll let, uh, let's go to uh, uh, Dr. Easton first and can answer both or one of those questions, it's up to you. Sure, sure, I'll, I'll probably cover a little bit of both, but I'll, I'll just really focus on the first question. Uh, so I'm a family medicine trained physician uh, and certainly uh, this is why I went into public health because I, I think community health is so important uh, in the work that we do uh, as local governments to ensure that all New Yorkers and in, in uh, any jurisdiction, but you know, here in, in New York City, uh, we want to ensure that all New Yorkers have the resources that would sustain uh, their emotional, their physical, and their social well-being, right? And that's really community health, right? The environment in which you live in and you really have all of the, all of the needs and all of the services that you uh, absolutely would require uh, to make sure that you have optimal health. Uh, and you know, particularly during this moment, uh, we have been uh, ensuring that New Yorkers have uh, what they need. Uh, and, but this is where we certainly need others to really step in and take on some of that responsibility. So you know, as you're looking at this slide, and you can see, uh, as Jackie talked about. You know, everyone played a part uh, in ensuring that uh, you know, we were really able to control the spread of coronavirus and SARS-CoV-2. You know, the, the, the core four, right? Washing your hands with water, 20 seconds, and use of hand sanitizer, face coverings when folks were going out, as we were starting talking about reopening, making sure you were physically distancing, and then also ensuring that you uh, either stayed home uh, when you were sick or you were accessing health care services. But in order to really do that, we have to make sure that our community, our environment have those resources. So that also means ensuring that our healthcare care systems have the capacity to really take care of those who are really severely sick and being able to access the physician and access to ventilators and, and things of that nature. And as we're reopening um, in the community, we want to ensure that individuals now have access to their providers and they have access to testing. And so that's where test and trace really comes in. Right? We need to make sure that as we're reopening uh, our community and we're in phase three now, you have access to testing. So we, 
really make sure that our providers, our community providers have access. We're, we're trying to work with our community organizations. And this is the partnership. This is that collective responsibility of ensuring that you have multiple points of access to those interventions. And then also thinking about take care of yourself. T- taking care of yourself once we identify individuals who really need uh, um, to the support to safely uh, separate from family members or, uh, or in thinking about what they will need. So, you know, those, these are all the resources that are in our community. So how do you access them? How do we message? And we talked about, you know, messaging is important. And sometimes government cannot lead with that messaging. We may have the right information, we may have the data, but we know that sometimes the messenger is just as important as the message. And so working with our community-based organizations to really amplify the right messages, but also to make sure that people have um, a ways in which they can counter some of the myths and the wrong messages, right? We know that there are messages that are there just not true. And so we have to be able to mitigate some of the wrong messages so people can access uh, the services that are available, right? There are clinics that are offering free. Yes, we do ask for ID, and we do ask for health insurance, but by no means are we turning anyone away, right? And those are the messages that we really need to get out there. People will feel like they're they're totally respected and that the dignity is there. And I think that connects to some of the equity pieces that we really need to show that that are out there. So I'll turn it over to Anna to to add more. Thank you, Dr. Easterling. And I would just add um, to what Dr. Easterling said in terms of equity. It's we, we we all know that at the beginning of this pandemic, um, a, a communities of colors of color were, were hit the hardest. And and um, historically, um, the these communities um, have been underserved um, by by previous administrations. Um, this administration had a focus on making sure that there was equitable distribution um, through our New York City and throughout all our communities and um two, two of the ways um i i would um I, I would just say that we made a um, huge announcement last week in in ways that we are reaching deeper into these communities and that was by creating a 10 um, million dollar um rfp um to fund um um, additional um, community-based organizations that can help us take our message um, straight to the community, can help us educate the community on why the importance of getting tested and who should be getting tested and who should be getting retested. Um, that, that you know, that um, initiative allows um, the partnerships between HMH, DOHMH, um, and um, the, trace, the Test and Trace Corps um, to really build partnerships with those trusted um, local um, local community organizations that are in 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 these areas that have um, strongholds and that have the trust of of um, the communities um, at large, we also announced a hyper local response um, initiative, which will allow us to go into areas who have high positive um, um, po- high positive um, testing but low, um, low, low percentage of people getting tested. And so with those two initiatives, this would allow us to be to build the, the equity we need across the city to ensure that all New Yorkers are getting tested in, in, in the ways that um, Jackie and Dr. Easton described. Thank you so much to both of you. I think, Annabelle, you, you touched on this um, in terms of what the nonprofit sector can do and what community-based organizations can do, both to advocate for their communities, but also advocate for test and trace, share that accurate information, ensure that people know that these resources are for them. Um, I want to turn it to Rebecca and hear if you have any additional thoughts on the importance of the the role of the nonprofit sector and um, of community-based organizations in ensuring that people have access to this critical information and and tools. Yeah, thanks, Anusha. Um, So community-based organizations are essential. Um, It's no surprise, and I don't think it's any secret, that there's a lot of distrust in institutions and in the government right now um, for for many reasons. Um, And so working with uh, the community organizations that serve, organize, serve and organize constituents locally on the ground every day on issues that impact them most is essential 
to getting the to getting the word out about test and trace expanded testing and the tracing program and communicating why it's important and why they should trust in New York City to take care of them if they test positive. So we, as Annabelle said, you know, we're we're definitely working with community-based organizations in a formal way, and that's going to be finalized pretty soon, I believe. Um, but there's a lot of opportunities to get involved, and we really need you to help out. Um, and partly because this is the only way, as as Dr. Easterling said, as Annabelle and Jackie said, this is the only way we can keep ourselves and our loved ones safe, short of a vaccine. And who knows when that's going to happen. Um, so what? So there's a lot of opportunities to get involved. Um, I have a sort of a general form where you can where you can sign up, and I can share that. Where you can sign up to um, spread the word via social media or do one of these for your own um, constituencies. We're happy to talk to your members and your clients um, via, via Zoom or, or WebEx or whatever platform makes sense to you. We wanna be talking to everybody all the time, but then there's also really great in-person opportunities to get involved. Um, we did this great day of action. I think it was, it was a week ago, it was last Wednesday. We were in all five boroughs and this also speaks to the equity issue, right? Folks were so, folks in the community were so happy that we were talking to them about, um, about testing sites that were right nearby. So, you know, one person texted me who's from the Bronx and said, no one ever does this, right? We really want to change that dynamic and get out there and talk to people in the community. And so about a hundred community-based organizations came out or helped us in a variety of ways to get the word out on July 8th. Um, and so we're um, and and say, you know, here's your local testing site, please get tested. Um, the and then so you can really help get the word out generally, but also through these actions. Um, we're having our next day of night of action. Um, actually, on Saturday, we've heard that there's an uptick in cases among ages 20 to 29. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're talking to folks and kids and no, they're not kids. Um, you, uh, young young adults um, who are going out to restaurants and bars and maybe being a little more, more relaxed. And we want to tell them this is no time to relax. You still need to wear your face covering. You still need to social distance and please get tested. And we're, we're going to try to have mobile testing sites down there. So we're going to be in Manhattan this Saturday. And we're going to try to do additional ones throughout the summer. And there will be lots of opportunities. So I'm going to give you a sign up form in the chat box. And Anusha has the and Stephanie have the information, so they can share it with you as well. Um, so you can sign up for the day of action, but you can also sign up to get involved generally. Um, and then, yeah, if you and and we also I put it earlier, but if in addition to going to the website, you can also text and you can take out your phone right now. Go to eight five five four eight. Put that in as the number and text COVID test and, and a bunch in the last for your zip code and a bunch of testing sites near you will um, will pop up. Um, and so, yeah, we really, we really need your help getting the word out. And we also want your ideas and your input and, you know, how should we be messaging and, um, Dr. Easterling and Annabelle work really closely with the crew of CBOs to make sure that we're messaging properly. Um, so, um, happy to answer any questions about that. And in just a moment, I'll put, I'll put those in the chat box. Perfect. Thank you, Rebecca. I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions. Thank you to those of you who have already put some questions in the chat. Um, you can feel free to add those either in the Q&A section um, or sent directly to panelists. Um, I first have one last question. Um, in all of the, the outreach efforts and in your plans and, and with Test and Trace to date, are there communities or neighborhoods or populations that are uh, focused? I think that's particularly important for the organizations and the staff who are on this call and figuring out who do they need to prioritize getting this message to and, um, and reaching out to, to make sure uh, folks know about Test and Trace and, and what to expect if they get the call. Thanks for that question, yeah. So absolutely, right? There are neighborhoods across the city that have lower testing rates than other neighborhoods. And we're actually working really hard to be, to get that data by zip code up on the Department of Health's website so everyone can see that. Um, but right now there are, um, I'll just go through a few of them. I'm not gonna capture all of them off the top of my head, but um, Upper Manhattan, 
So East Harlem, Washington Heights, uh, the Soundview neighborhood of the Bronx, um, Southeast Queens, Oz the Ozone Park area, Richmond Hill, and then in Brooklyn, Southern Brooklyn, um, tend to be areas that are that we would consider to be under tested, right? Where we need more testing. There are testing sites in all of those areas. We have had a really concerted effort to make sure that there's not a neighborhood in the city that doesn't have access to testing. We also have mobile vans. Um, I think we're up to six of them now uh, that are, are out spanning out across the city and will be at 10 by August um, to go hyper local areas. Um, we've got a project going on right now in the zip code 10457. That's really the Tremont Belmont area of the Bronx where we've actually brought um, what we call point of care testing there to two locations. Those are tests that can give you a result while you're still in the testing site. And it's about a 15 minute turnaround time. Um, so yes, there are definitely neighborhoods that we would, we would um, consider to be under tested. And we're working to, we're sort of constantly moving resources into, into those neighborhoods. Um, we just did a big project out at Star at City uh, where we were seeing um, higher than average percent positivity uh, and lower than average testing uh, to try to turn that around in that neighborhood. Um, in terms of our particular focus, we actually really, as Rebecca said, we're really right now focused on 20 to 29 year olds. We're seeing the rate of cases across the board in New York City decline. That's really good news. Uh, but we saw an increase, a pretty significant increase between 20 uh, for 20 to 29 year olds. And for those of us 30 to 39, we're not seeing a decrease. So we're sort of seeing a very gradual up increase. We think that that is about increased socializing. Um, the, and, and in fact, the neighborhoods in particular where we're seeing that are not the neighborhoods that were hit hardest during COVID. They're the Lower East Side and the Financial District. And um, I don't wanna get this wrong. And so uh, that maybe Rebecca or Annabelle, you know more off the top of your head, but they are, um, they're, they are uh, more upper middle class neighborhoods. They're neighborhoods with a higher percentage of white New Yorkers in them, um, where we're now seeing this increase amongst 20 to 29 year olds. So we're very focused there. Um, we're really, you know, the way we decide, the way we focus is we focus where are people not getting tested? Where are we seeing spread happening now? And by focusing on those two things, we think that we can, we can, um, target our resources to stop the virus now. Thank you. And, and particularly if we're seeing these upticks, you know, it's because folks are feeling a little bit more lax, but in the long run, test and trace will enable our communities to open and reopen faster and more safely, right? Yes. That's yeah. Right. And I also want to say, maybe you said it, I missed it, like young people, you know, I'm 32, I can still get very sick. You can still get very sick, yeah. even if you're young and you can and could very likely spread it to people we care about. So, you know, important. Yeah, that's totally right. Um, so I'm gonna move us towards questions because we have some fantastic questions that people have already posed. Um, and my colleague Steph is going to lead us through those. Hi everyone, so thanks for submitting questions. I'm gonna start uh, towards the top. Um, we, we mentioned this question, but maybe we can just reiterate again. What is done to ensure that COVID-19 results and information from contact tracing is not shared with law enforcement or ICE? So um, first of all, we believe we're not legally allowed to share it. Um, so that's the first thing, right? That the there is real city law governing who can see this data, how they can see this data. 100% of our staff go through confidentiality training and all of the data systems that we use have not only gone through security reviews, they we have put them through full on tests where we attempt to hack our own system. Um, and they, they at this point all meet HIPAA requirements in, in, too, even though they're actually not required to meet HIPAA requirements. And so we take data privacy incredibly seriously. Um, and and we may, we've made decisions in this program from the get-go that we want to increase participation, that we're doing this program not as a, one of enforcement and compliance, but one of participation um, and, and really opt-in. 
And we know that people's privacy is important in order to drive that participation. And and part of the, and just to add to what Jackie um, has um, shared, part of the intake process, um, we're not asking for anyone's individual immigration status. So that's not a question that is being asked of anyone. And it's not a question that anyone should be answering. Great, thank you. All right, I'm gonna paraphrase this question. So if anyone were to go to a testing center listed um, and they're asked uh, to pay for the test, what should they do? Sure, so um, a couple things. Most, all of the city's testing sites are free and, and any, any site that is an official city partner will test anyone regardless of um, insurance. There are other sites in the city writ large that the city ourselves don't control that are, um, in, uh, that are requiring someone to have insurance. So if you don't have insurance, what I would say is, is go to any of the H and H sites, any of the city sponsored sites, all city MD has agreed to test anyone without insurance. Um, Advantage care is testing anyone regardless of insurance. So you might have to, I believe, Rebecca, you can tell me if I'm wrong. I believe on our website, it is listed. Okay, so if you go to the website, COVID test, uh, nyc.gov backslash COVID test, just look to make sure that it's listed, that you can go even if you don't have insurance. And you should always but, call though. And it, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, just to double check. Um, but, but the other thing is, if you do have insurance, bring your insurance card. Because even though it's free to you, it's not free to us, right? We're paying for all of it. And so the more that we can get insurance to cover, the more people we can test writ large. Um, but any of the city sites, you won't be charged. There's no copay, you're not charged, but it is good if you have insurance, bring the card with you. Great, thanks. Um, scrolling down to other questions around the hoteling program. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit to how hotels are assigned? Are they assigned based on where someone lives or are they based on other, um, other factors? So right now, um, we, we don't have lots of hotels. Um, the hotel program is actually pretty small. We want it to be bigger. Um, anyone who wants a hotel room gets a hotel room. So it's not small because we're turning people away. But it's small because we're finding that people would prefer to um, isolate or quarantine in their own homes. Um, so, so right now, there's not like a choice of hotels. You are assigned the, we, we, we run a couple hotels. We are assigned one of those hotels. Um, we don't give out the location of that hotel or the address of that hotel to protect the people that are there. Um, but I can tell you a few things. It's a nice hotel. People report being sort of surprised how nice it is. Um, the rooms are big. That was really important to us. We didn't want to put people in small rooms. They're big rooms. Um, they have amenities. There's an outdoor area. There's ways you, you're not stuck in your room. There are ways to be out in the hotel um, fully masked with whatever protection you need and socially distant, um, but it's a very nice hotel. All right, thank you. Um, we have another question coming in. Um, if our teams are out every day, so this includes both staff and volunteers, if you're currently engaging volunteers at your organization, um, and they're in contact with a large amount of people handing out masks or any information, should those people also be tested for COVID-19? And how often do you recommend they be tested? So I saw that question. I think that question popped up when I was talking about who should get repeat tested. So I would say like, if your staff are working out in the community, they should all get tested at least once, right? If they haven't been tested, send them all to get tested. If they're um, working on a regular basis in the community, what you need to ask yourself about their work is, are they spending 10 or more minutes with one person face to face within six feet? I've seen a lot of the work that's getting done about handing out masks or going up to groups and asking people to distance from each other. And that's not, it's not really close contact for a sustained period of time, right? First of all, it's outdoors. All activity outdoors is vastly safer than activity indoor. The first thing I wanna say. Second of all, you're, you're sort of handing someone a mask, stepping back, having a few minute, you know, a two minute, three minute interaction with them moving on. That is a lot, um, that has less risk 
associated with it than if I was having a face to face conversation with someone within six feet, the same person to me for 15 minutes. Um, but testing is free and it's available. And so if, it, if I were running an organization that was doing that work, I would not require testing of my staff, but I would in, deeply encourage it. Um, and I would, I think I would tell my staff, you know, every couple of weeks, go get another test. Um, and if they have an interaction that they think was particularly close, um, they worried that someone else wasn't wearing a mask or they're wearing a mask or they got within six feet for an extended period of time, go get a test. Great, thanks, Jackie. Um, another question around uh, testing and mobile sites. Uh, will my, let me see, sorry. Uh, are there mobile sites or time slots at a nonprofit or local organization that my nonprofit can request for staff, volunteers, or clients? Yes, sure. Um, so we, a lot of our mobile sites actually are partnering up with faith-based organizations and churches. Um, so they're sort of using the parking lots of churches or parks across the street from churches. Um, but if you have a CBO uh, or you're running a, a residential program and, and you think it would be helpful to have a mobile van, uh, you can reach out to us. I can't guarantee it. Um, the demand is really high, as you can expect. Um, but if we're already in the neighborhood for a week or we've already planned to be close by or there's not a testing site close by, um, we'll, we'll absolutely try to make it work. Uh, so you can reach out to me or to Rebecca or to Annabelle and we can pass that on to our testing team. If you run, I, there's something about the way the question was worded that I that makes me think you run a congregate setting, like you run, um, I don't, you know, that there are clients on site. If it's a residential congregate setting, so people are sleeping over there, um, then we have special dedicated vans and and special dedicated staff, and we absolutely want to come out and test your clients. So um, if you if it is a nursing home or an adult care facility. You would be talking to the Department of Health, but we can connect you. Uh, if it's a shelter um, or a program run through ACS or DSS, you'd be talking to the Department of Homeless Services that are running those vans, and, but we can also connect you. We have big residential congregate setting testing operations going on. Okay, great. Um, all right, just sorting through some other questions. Um, all right, we have a, we had a question come in. If someone was traced and asked to quarantine, do their household and their contacts also quarantine? So for exam, example, if a child tested positive at school or let's say in a camp or a group activity, um, who, will be, who will be traced and asked to quarantine? Okay, so I'm gonna split those questions into two. So if you, um... If you're a contact, so you're not a case, I have a close exposure to someone, but it's not someone in my household. I need to quarantine. My wife does not need to quarantine. So if my mother had COVID, I saw my mother without my wife. I have to quarantine because I am a close contact. My wife, who is a contact of a contact, does not have to quarantine. If I get symptoms, not if I get a test that says I'm positive, but if Four days later, I'm quarantining and now I have a cough. Now, yes, my wife does have to quarantine because we assume I have it. We are basically in that moment where I got a cough, I, be, I go from being a contact to being a case, even without a test. That's the first answer to the first question. In terms of how we're treating um, school classes, so, so those decisions are getting made now, and that's information that the Department of Education will be sharing. We're working hand in glove with the Department of Education team to come up with all of the appropriate policies and protocols to keep our kids and our staff and our teachers safe this, this school year. Um, you know, we really deeply believe that, that as much as possible, kids should be back in schools. It's better for them, it's better for their parents, but we have to keep them safe. And contact tracing, testing and tracing will be a huge part of that. Um, but the, the specific dynamic of if there's a case, who's, who, who, who goes home and gets quarantined and who doesn't, um, we're, we're working out now and, and the Department of Education will be announcing when they're ready to make that announcement for a daycare. So some daycares are open now um, for a daycare. If there is a kid in that class, let's say there's a three year old in an early learn class, the whole class would be quarantined at this point. All right, great. So uh, we'll do two more questions before we kick it over to Rebecca for any next steps and resources that uh, we'll plan to share with everyone. 
Um, this one's around employment. How should people apply to be a contact tracer and where should uh, all of our participants redirect the community to sign up for uh, contact tracing? So we hired um, about 3,500 people in May and there was so much interest. Um, uh, we got over 10,000 applications. I think we got actually over 15,000 applications at this point. So we are actually not hiring anymore. Um, that doesn't mean we won't hire come fall, but, but there is so, you know, we hired as if we were gonna see somewhere between 800 and 1,000 cases a day in New York City at this point, and we're seeing under 300 cases a day. Um, and so we stopped at 3,500 people. Uh, so we're not currently hiring contact tracers. Um, however, we are. Um, uh, we did last week put out a request for a proposal for community-based organizations. It was, or we put it out two weeks ago. It was due this Monday um, to apply to be um, like ambassadors for us around encouraging people to get tested, encourage mask wearing, encourage social distancing. I expect as we start to make those awards, those organizations might be hiring, uh, but the city right now isn't hiring them. And our final question is, uh, would you share any information on when those organizations will be alerted if they've won the RFP funding? Um, Torian, I know when we're in the middle of awards, we're not allowed to talk about it. So I don't know what I'm allowed to say <laughs> from a procurement uh, standpoint, do you? Well, we, we, yeah, we published a response. So okay. organizations will start to learn this week, the week of the 13th, and we'll be able to start to uh, be informed of these awards. As much as I can say. And we are that that RFP is a real partnership between the T2 program and, and uh, the program that Dr. Easterling runs at the Department of Health, and we're excited about that partnership. Awesome. Thank you. I'm going to just quickly turn it over to Rebecca and then Anusha for final um, notes. Rebecca, if you just want to quickly share um, the the or touch talk to, top line about the resources that we'll share um, in the email follow up. Yeah, thank you, Steph. Um, so as I said before, we have a night of action coming up this Saturday. You can sign up. Steph will be sharing that information with you all. Um, additionally, um, I'm sure she shares regularly, but we'll continue to share social media messages that you can retweet. We also have a packet that um, I can share with Steph, if that makes sense, that includes social media and also um, sample text if you want to email your own constituents about this. And then as soon as we have social media targeted directly to the 20 to 29 year olds, we're, we're coming up with some clever stuff. Um, we'll share that with you guys as well. Um, I, and so, and then additionally, you can sign up generally to just get um, updates um, or packets from me directly or sign up to do a town hall or a meeting with your constituents, either through step or through me or through that Google. So thank you so much. Thanks, Rebecca. And I'll turn it over to Anusha Venkatraman. Yeah, of course. Um, thank you so much. This was such an incredibly informative panel. I know I learned a lot that I can share with my neighbors, my family members, and, and colleagues, too. So thank you for your, your time. Um, thank you to your, to your agencies, the Test and Trace Corps, NYC Health and Hospital, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, um, and to all of the folks who joined as attendees. Um, you are out there doing this work. You are incredibly valued. Thank you for your, your thoughtful questions, um, and please be in touch. Um, I know we're gonna send some follow-up information um, to everyone who attended to make sure that you have um, the right details on where to go, to get information, what to share with your community members. Everything can be found at nyc.gov slash COVID test. Um, and Rebecca mentioned some other resources that will be sent out as well. So I just wanna thank you for your time. Thank you for your, your energies um, and have a fantastic day. Can I make one last pitch? Sorry. Yeah, go for it. If you're an organization and you want to host a panel like this about test and trace with your members or your clients or your community, we would love to do that. Um, so, so invite us to come talk to your organization. We'll be there. That's a great pitch. Um, one that NYC Service took you up on, and I'm so glad. 
that we did. Um, I think this is a really important resource for all of our community members and organizations. Um, so thank you again. We will be in touch um, and have a fantastic week. Thank you.